Uh, it's amazing. Me, me and my uh, family, we've been doing Bible study. Uh, and we've been talking about, we've been reading out of the book of Ephesians for the last, I don't know, sweetheart, what, two years <laughs> doing a Bible study. And I was asking God, I said, God, what would you have for us again today? And he said, no, nah, you got to go back to Ephesians because I'm not done with you yet in that, in that book, right? So that's why we're here, saints. But let's, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 3. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Again, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And it says this. It says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. It says, With all humility, gentleness, with patience, <laughs> showing tolerance for one another, here it is, in love. Verse number three, it says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, amen? The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you again. Uh -huh. <sighs> to serve an amazing God, a holy God, a righteous God, Lord. We thank you for another opportunity, God, to hear from you, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of salvation that none of us deserve. God, truth be told, we should be dead in sin, but God, you made us alive in you, God. So when we understand and we're talked this morning, as you remind us what unity in the body looks like God if, as you adjust our attitudes and take the focus off of self our problems and our pain so we can put the focus back on your promises and your plan God because you're faithful not because we deserve it but God you're faithful to your word Lord so have your way in our hearts Lord I pray that I, as I stand before your people I proclaim your truth with clarity not to entertain them, but God, so they can feel the spirit of God, your spirit penetrating it in their hearts, our hearts, so we can leave this place not the same because we've been in an encounter with the holy God. So God, I love you so much in spite of me. God, let your people see you. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. What again, good morning, solid word. I have to keep taking my glasses off and on because I'm in that between stage. You know what I mean? But my aim is straightforward is this. I'll read it real quick. It says, God is glorified uh, when the church is living to match their position in Christ. Here it is. In order for this to happen, the body first must have a Christ-like attitude that is diligent to preserve unity by the power, not our power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the, church will be, the, then the church will reflect the oneness in the Trinity and do all what God has purposed us to do. Then we can do what all God has purposed us to do. And I titled this sermon this morning, saints, an attitude adjustment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm a, I, I've been married for almost 26 years, y'all. Come in August, I've got three kids and I've got a grandbaby. And every now and then, I need an attitude adjustment, y'all. You know, I, I always tell my, 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 my kids, I said, you know, y'all need an attitude adjustment. And I know they look at me and they say, no, Daddy, you need an attitude. They don't say that. But you know how some people can just think that and you can already tell? I tell you what, this weekend, I needed an attitude adjustment, y'all. And my daughter's right here, sweetheart, and I love you, but I just have to be real, you know, and I'm doing this out of love. I need an attitude adjustment. My daughter, Sydney Morgan, she graduated from Ball State this weekend, y'all. Ain't he good, y'all? Praise God. He's good. Thank you, God, for allowing my daughter to graduate from Ball State. But me and her mom was driving. We got there to pick her up this weekend. And, and, and you would think, because my house in Ball State is probably, I don't know, what, 35-minute drive at best? My daughter's been home probably 10 times in the last two months, y'all. And why did I go up into her room? And she had all her stuff still in her room. Her winter clothes, her boot. I said, sweetheart, you had plenty enough time to bring some of that stuff home. 
Why is your room still looking, living, looking like you're still there? Why was my daughter's room completely made up, y'all? I'm saying, really? And how, you know how it is when you can start feeling it coming on? I'm like, uh-oh, Lord, help me, Jesus, Jesus. And he said, remember to talk. Remember, remember, remember my word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, what, what's your attitude like this morning, Solid Word? Huh? huh? What, what, what's your attitude like? Can we just be real, real quick? Let me ask you, here's a test. Well, well when you're driving down the street, you late for work, because, you know, some of us just don't get to work quite on time. We still struggle with that. God is still working with us on that thing. And there's somebody who comes right in front of you, and they driving like 10 miles an hour on the highway. What, what is your attitude like, right? I don't know about you, but I'm like, really? This day? You're going to drive 10 miles an hour? What about this one? You're driving, right? And, uh, and, and then you got your turn signal on, and the person next to you, they, they can see your turn signal, but they won't slow down and let you come over. And you like, dude, you see me, right? And it's like, really? What is what? I don't know. Maybe it's just me, y'all. But what's, what's your attitude like this morning? Let me ask you this. What's your attitude like when things don't go your way? Yeah, yeah, when your feelings get hurt, right? Yeah, when you don't get the recognition you think you deserve. What's your attitude like then? What's your attitude like when you're suffering? Ooh, when you're going through a trial. Has anybody been through a trial at Tyler Word? Maybe it's just me. What is your attitude like? Huh? But let me ask you this. What was Christ's attitude like over 2,000 years ago when it says he willingly went to a cross for undeserving people? What was going through his mind? Think about that. So the next time we try to understand our trials, think about what he was getting ready to go through for me and you. What was Christ's attitude look like? But let me ask you this. Here's the question that we're going to deal with the text this morning. I promise you we're going to get to it. It's this. What's the attitude of a church that truly has a desire to glorify God? Is it a Christ-like attitude? What's solid words attitude like now? If we really say we're solid word in our purpose and our mission statement is to bring God the glory, what's our attitude like? this morning. And Paul is going to deal with that because what he's, he's dealing with now, he's dealing with a church, you know, in Ephesus. And he writes this epistle, this letter, around 60, 61 AD. And what he's doing, he's reminding the church of this, a couple of things. He's reminding them is that, wait a minute, you guys got to remember who you are in Christ. What's your position because you've been saved in Christ Jesus? Then he reminds them of this. He says, now that you're one in Christ, that you should be one in Christ, how are you loving each other? Are you united and allowing the Spirit of God to resonate in your hearts, in your homes, in solid word? And he's, making, he's, he's talking to a church, y'all, the ecclesia, the congregation, the ones who have been called out. And they're made up of Jews and Gentiles, and the word Gentile means non-Jews. And all of a sudden, he's putting this thing together, y'all. And he's reminding them what it looks like. So the question again, it says the church that glorifies God when it has a Christ-like attitude and it's united in the oneness by the power of the Holy Spirit, it does three things. The body of Christ does this by number one, being committed to our calling. These are your points. Number two, having a conduct, conduct worthy of our calling. And number three is this when we are completely united in our calling. Let me say that again. Committed to our calling, conduct worthy of our calling, and completely united in our calling. When we do, do those three things, y'all, that's what brings glory because we are truly one in Christ with our, action, and on our actions and our attitude. Very first point is this. Committed to our calling. Verse number one, it says, therefore, Church, what's the therefore for? We've been there before. We've heard that before. What's the therefore? What's the reason for the therefore? Can somebody help me out this morning? Because what? Elder Marcellus, the singer, he says it right there. He says, something came right on my brother. Right on my brother. And what Paul was doing is this. He's going back to the three previous chapters, right? 
before we get to chapter 4. And he starts off in chapter 1 and he says this. He reminds the people of God. He calls them saints. Do you know what the word saints means this morning, y'all? When you hear the word saints, what does that mean? It means the ones that have been separated, not to the world, but to who? To Jesus Christ. He reminds them of their position in Christ. And he says in Christ, y'all, 35 times in this letter, this epistle alone. He uses the word in Christ 35 times. When, God, when, when the Spirit of God is moving and he repeats himself in Scripture, is that important, y'all? It is. And he says, in Christ. And he goes us to, and back to chapter 1. He says, that, he says this. He reminds us who we are in Christ. Do you ever have to be reminded of who you are in Christ? Huh? I don't, is it just me? Because when you're dealing with your job, when you're dealing with uh, your family, when you're dealing with your fine, with illness, whatever you're dealing with this morning, let me be real. When you're dealing with church folk, Come on, y'all. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, we cute and we dressed up. But church folk have issues too, y'all. And so we have, I have to be, let me just put myself out there. I have to be reminded of who I am in Christ daily, saints. Daily. And, 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 and Paul does this. He says this. He says, and, and, and again, chapter one, he says, God has already, he said, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessings, y'all, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, y'all. Is that good news this morning? He didn't say, I will bless you. Like in the Old Testament, he would tell the Jews, if you obey me, I will bless you. I will do this thing. He says, no, -uh, saints, I've already blessed you because you're in me, y'all. He says, I've blessed you. He's given you all the blessings, me and you, all that we need for life and godliness. That means, uh, Pastor Bo, there's nothing that's left out. When God does something, y'all, he does it right, y'all. We are completely covered in Jesus Christ. But the good news, it doesn't stop there, y'all. He said he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you understand what that means, y'all? Before me and you were even a thought, God already had a plan to choose us. He chose us before the, is that good news, solid word? Man, but, but, but guess what, Peter? It keeps getting better than that. He doesn't stop. It says this, he says, we have been, we have redemption through his blood. Whose blood is he talking about this morning, saints? He's talking about the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. He says, I've redeemed you by the blood. He said, I've covered you with my blood this morning, solid word. He says, we've been redeemed by his blood. And then he says this in verse number 13, it says, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. In other words, is that he says, not only do I have the power to save you, I have the power to keep you while you're going through your trial this morning. See, some of us, it says, man, is this how the story is? In? Is this the best it gets? He says, no, I have the power to keep you through this thing. The question of, that we have to answer this morning is who do we look like while, we, while we're going through it, y'all? In, in, in chapter number two, it gets better, y'all. I'm telling you, we're going to get there. But in chapter number two, he's still reminding us of who we are. He says, even though we were dead in our trespasses, in our, in our sins. And it says, I love this word, but God, y'all. Can, 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 can we just say, but God, y'all. But, but God, it says, being rich in mercy, y'all. Because it's his great love, which, when he, which he loved us, y'all. It's his great love in which he loved me and you. That's what he says. He says he made us alive together in Christ. It says, by grace we have been saved, saints. We have been saved by God's amazing grace this morning. And in chapter 3, Paul begins to paint the picture. He says, because God saved us, the mystery, he begins to talk about the mystery. He, he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles being together now in one body to serve one God, y'all. He says he, he brought... Jews and Gentiles together for a purpose. And he says the purpose is to be the body of Christ that he's called us to be. He says that. And then I love at the end of chapter 3, y'all, uh, Paul has three prayers in this epistle. This is the second one. And he begins to pray for the church. I like this prayer right here. He says that, then again, he's praying for the church. He said, be strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, be strengthened in your inner man, Pastor Bowden. In your inner man, deep inside. And then he says this, 
Christ may dwell in our hearts, rooted and grounded. So when the storms come, we don't have to bend or break because we know that we've been deep in Christ. That's what it means to be rooted and grounded, saints. But then it says this. It still gets better, y'all. It says, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Knowledge. And then he goes on and says, filled up to all the fullness of God. That's what he's talking about, the love of Christ. And then he says this. Paul wrote 13 epistles, but he says, just in case I forgot to mention some. You know, I, I've done some great things, but I know my, fine, my, my mind is limited. Just in case I forgot to mention some. He says this. He says, now to him who is able. That's what he says. He said, just in case, to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ever ask or think. Paul said, I can't even fathom what my God can do. But I do know this. Now to him that is able to do exactly what he said he would do, saints. That's good news this morning. Because we can pray for some stuff. But God says, your prayers are too small. You don't understand what I have in store for you. All you have to do is keep your eyes on me. That's what he says. And then in verse number 21, he talks about the purpose now. I love this. It says, to him be the glory. Not the pastor. Not me. Not you. It says, to him be the glory, right? In the church, in Christ Jesus, for all generations, forever and ever and ever. In other words, it no, never runs out. Saints. And that brings us to the therefore. He says, for that reason, therefore, for that reason. Ah, he's already blessed you. So how do you respond? What's your responsibility? He said, because I've already blessed you with all that you need. What is our responsibility? And then he says, I, the prisoner of the Lord. See, Paul had to do some time, y'all. Y'all do know that, right? But the reason why Paul had to do some time is because he was not ashamed of the gospel, y'all. He wouldn't back down even in spite of opposition, even in spite of persecution, even in spite of imprisonment. He said, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of him this morning? Even if it costs you your life, would you give your life for your Savior? Is he worth it? See, I know some people, let's put it this way, who've been away for a while. We won't say prison. But I can tell you, I can put some money on it this morning. Their testimony won't be that because I've been away for a while, because I was serving Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. I know some people in here who maybe been away for a while, y'all. Is that your testimony? But, but Paul says this. He says, no, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Willingly bring it on, world, because I know who my daddy is, and I know what my inheritance looks like. He said, bring it on. He said, I am a prisoner in spite of opposition. Then it says, and I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. That word implore, he means beg. He's pleading with a sense of urgency. Paul says, I'm not too proud to beg. I will beg you because he understands what's at stake here. He says, I'll beg you to walk. That word walk means to, to live. It's our conduct, y'all. It says, walk in a worthy manner. And when you think about the word worthy manner, think about this. Equal weight. One's calling and conduct should be in balance. Did y'all get that? Write that down. One's calling and conduct. When we talk about walking worthy, a manner that's worthy, if my, if my conduct is here, and I already know because we know we're the ones in call, and we're in Christ, right? And my calling is here. And my conduct is here. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. And he says that this, this is what it should look. It's living to match one's position in Christ. A life that expresses gratitude for God for the gift of salvation. Let me ask you this morning, saints, what does our thank you look like? Now, I know we can say thank you, but what is our, if we had to, to visualize what thank you look like, what does that look like for us this morning? Huh? If, if we truly have a heart of a gratitude, of an appreciation, because we know, I know, Kenny knows, there's nothing, as the songs say, you thought I was worth saving? Really? There's nothing in me that God should have stepped out of heaven for me. There's, can I, can I, I, I don't want to call you out, but I have to be real. There's nothing in you that God should have stepped out of heaven for you. 
but he did it. So when we think about what our thank you looks like individually and collectively as a body, what does that look like this morning? Do we really truly appreciate his amazing grace? <laughs> By the way, while you're going through your stuff, do you still appreciate it? Then he talks about calling. And I like this. Calling is this. It's a believer's calling to salvation prompted by the Holy Spirit that's in us that calls us to believe. It's the Spirit of God. It's the gift of salvation. But let's not miss it. It's more than, yeah, it's the salvation calling. We got that. But it also refers to the unity in the body. See, God called us not to be solo saints so I can go and do this faith journey by myself. He says, no, I've called you collectively in one body. We ne I need you. We need each other, y'all. He says that we're one body in him. He's called us for that, y'all. A union with Christ. Paul was reminding the church, regardless of their ethnic background, social status, gender, race, when we became believers, we became one, mem one body. And it says this in, in verse number five. It says we serve one Lord, y'all. One faith, one baptism, because we got one Father. It's one Spirit. He said, we became one. I don't care if you live in Carmel. I don't care if you live in Hallville. I don't care if you're on the north side. I don't care if you're on the west side. I don't care if you own your own company. I don't care if you're homeless. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. We are called to be in one in Christ. We come with hidden agendas sometimes, y'all. See, when we start thinking about the problems that's going on in the house, the sanctuary of the Most High, but really, do we have a heart? Does, does our church look like the Christ that he saved us to? Do we look like Jesus Christ, y'all? Or have we allowed selfishness, conceit, bitterness, anger, rob us, rob the body of what Christ is doing through us? Because I've got my own agenda in mind. When things were changing in the church and things didn't go our way, how we thought they should go. Did we have it? Was it because we had our own agenda and we were disappointed and we missed God? You're working this out for your glory, not mine. Did we miss him, saints? Did we miss him? He said he's working this thing out for him. Paul was committed to his calling. Even if he have to endure some time, some hardship. And he's reminding us, the church today, to do the same. The first step in a worthy walk, we must have a Christ-like conduct, an attitude. Conduct worthy of our calling. Some of the Jews at that particular time, this is why Paul focused so much on the unity in the body. Because some of the Jews at that particular time, because of the, you know, they were Jews that were converted to be Christians, but they were holding on to some stuff. Because of their rich inheritance, because of their bloodline, when the, when the Gentiles came in, the non-Jews, they began to look at them. And they said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know we're supposed to love, but I still have a problem with this thing right here. Because who I am or what I think I deserve. You know, so, 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 so Paul was saying, before we can ever get to the, the going out and doing, the mission statements, church attendance, all the things which are good things, don't get me wrong. He says, nah, -uh. before we can get there, before you can go out and do those things, I got to first start with your attitude. Because if I don't start with your attitude, it may look good. You might impress a few people, but your attitude is funky in the inside. And I know that. So it says before we can really come together as a community of believers, to live for Christ, he says, I got to adjust your attitude. And he talks about these three virtues real quick. And the very first one he talks about, and, and, and they, they're progressive, meaning that the first one leads to the second one. You can't do the second one without the first one. And he talks about with all humility, with all. He didn't say with a little bit of humility. He says with all humility, y'all. And that word humility means loneliness, lowliness, I'm sorry. It's an honest assessing ourselves in the light of God's holiness. Here it is, in our sinfulness. I borrowed that from you, Mo. 
Yeah, he did, Mo did, uh, Maurice Taylor did a Bible study. But I like it. Look what it says again. I'll read it again. It says, assessing ourselves in the light of God's holiness. He's holy, right? In our sinfulness. So when I look at a holy God who even dares to have a one or have a relationship with me, even he's still one, he's calling, he's running, he's running after me, really? When we see that, y'all, we should understand. It should make us fall to our ground. Because we know we can talk about what somebody else did. But when we look at our own background, not some stuff, put it not forget last year. I'm talking about 2017. And we keep bringing into the sanctuary stuff, old garbage and baggage. And then we say, God, you still thought I was worth saving? You still thought I was worth dying for? Really? So if that's not enough to get you low with a whole, a lowly spirit, a, a holy to bow down in submission to God, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is. See, this virtue is listed first because of Paul's emphasis on unity. Here it is. Pride promotes disunity. Humility promotes unity, y'all. It promotes unity. And here's the deal. When you think, here's a test. When you think you have achieved that and you're a humble person, when you say, okay, God, I got that one. Check. Can I give you a secret? That's when you lose it. You, you know what I'm saying? When you, when you, you, when you think that you're already there, you, that's when you lost it. Because we should always, I'd always be in our mindset, in our heart. I need to be humble. I need to be more humble. Because my standard is not Elder Marcellus. My standard is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that until I'm with him in heaven and glory one day, man, I got much work to be done. God is not finished with me yet. Thank God. It says, where are we tempted in pride this morning, y'all? Come on now, because, you know, the reason why we can't be humble, y'all, is because some of that pride stuff that we still hold on to, you don't have to say amen, but I understand, because I know me. And John MacArthur, I like this. He talks about different kind of pride that we have. He talks about the appearance pride. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, our focus is bringing attention to ourselves when we have appearance pride. You know what I'm saying? So we, we love the mirror in the malls. We, we, we do. See, we, we love our some stuff. We spend hours and hours getting ourselves groomed and pretty and all, you know, dialed out. And we go to the mall and spend all kind of money, even when we don't have it, so people can look at us, so we can say, look at me. But to see, the problem becomes when we say that we're in Christ. He didn't say, do all this stuff so people can see you. He says, I'm not concerned with the outside because the outside can be all made up and dialed up. He said, what I'm, look what I'm talking about here, saints, is the inside. So when people go through all the makeup, all the fancy clothes, all that kind of stuff, do, do they see me in you? Or do you push that aside because you're too busy glorifying yourself for some people who don't care nothing about you? They'll run out of your life. Give them a chance. But we spend our last dime trying to impress people or to boast ourselves up so we can feel good about ourselves. But all we have to do is say, I'm in Christ. I don't have to feel God. God has already given me. I'm saved. I don't need those other exterior things, those other stuff, those clothes and stuff. Appearance pride. What about spiritual pride, saints? Yeah, yeah, this is dangerous, y'all. See, some of us, yeah, we didn't been to Bible college. You know, we tucked a few of them Bible verses in our back pocket. We got that boy now. You know, we know our theology, hermeneutics. We got all that kind of stuff. I can break down some text. And we're the first person that says that after the church, the service is over, and you run down to the table to get the CD. Boy, I can't wait to give this to so-and-so. Boy, I can't wait to give them this CD. But we know scripture so tough. But the problem with that is that we can call out other people's sin. Well, in verse number this or that, it says this about that sin. But the problem becomes, do we apply it to ourselves? Do we have a desire to take that same knowledge? He says, I don't want the head knowledge. Jesus says, I want your heart. Keep all that. You're not impressing me. That's what the Pharisees did. What about the ability pride, y'all? Huh? Is that another one? When we talk about ability, you know, some of us say, well, 
while we were going through our season, Solid World Church, it was me to help keep this glue. I was the glue that kept this thing together. When I wrote that big check on that day, it was me. When I volunteered, when nobody else showed up, it was me. I'm keeping this thing going because it was me. Really? And we're waiting for somebody to pat us on the back. So if our names don't pull in the, appear in the bulletin, or we don't stand here and recognize you, then you walk away mad. You frustrated. Because I'm waiting for somebody to tell me what good job I've done. Jesus says, forget that you, you're supposed to do those things and much more. You know, you don't need no special pat on the back for being Christ-like. That comes with the... This comes with the authority. It comes with our title, y'all. That's what it means to be Christ-like, to be, be humble. In 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, it's 5 and 6, it says this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Watch this. That he may exalt you at the proper time. We don't have to worry about exalting ourselves because the word of God says that he will do the exalting. In this proper time, saints, right? We don't have to worry about it. And then Jesus Christ, again, being Christ-like. Man, I, I love this. In, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, I love these verses. When it talks about Jesus Christ, he was in glory with the Father, and he did what? He emptied himself, y'all. But here's what the thing. We rush through those Bible verses because we hear them all the time. But try this. Put your name after that. How about this? It says this. You know, when he talks about Jesus, he says that, he said, Kenny, Pete, Tony, I emptied myself for you. I emptied myself to you. I was willing to go and die, not just any kind of death, but I was willing to do it, death on a cross. I was willing to be humiliated for you, for your sins. I was willing to take that on. I took one for the team. I was willing to do that for you. And it says in verse 9 that in the right time, it said God exalted him. And then it said he put, you know, everything in submission to him. That every knee shall bow, saints, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The next one real quick is gentleness, y'all. I can't be gentle unless I'm first humble. Again, we have to do this thing in order, right? It says gentleness is this. It's meekness. It's the opposite of self-exertion, rudeness, and harshness, right? It suggests having one's emotions under control. Can I say that again? Having one's emotions under control. Sometimes, if we're honest, do we struggle sometime in that area? Keeping us, our emotions under control. When something happens to us and it don't quite go our way. When our boss didn't give us that promotion and we worked hard for that thing. Huh? When we've been praying for some people and they continue to, uh, it hurts. But the key is this. It says, motion's under control. But it doesn't define, it doesn't say to be weak. But it's power under control, y'all. How we control God's power in us. I was watching the movie Superman. This was a while ago. And I remember the scene that when he was not Superman yet, he was still a boy. I guess he was Superboy. And, and Superboy was getting beat down. There's some bullies that were uh, pushing him, making fun. And they, and they pushed him to a wall. And I'm sorry, to a fence. And he grabbed the fence pole and he began to bend it. And he could have gave them a super, super beat down. He could have done that. But still, he restrained himself because he had the power to do that, y'all. But he said, nah, uh, you know, I'm going to keep my, my power in control. Gentleness, y'all. What areas in our lives, y'all, in solid world, do we need to work on that individually in a church? Do we continue to allow our emotions to get the best of us? Huh? Do we still want to get a lick back? In Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 5, it says this. It says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. In Matthew 11, verse 29, it says this. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, y'all. 
how do we become gentle? How do we become humble? God says, take my yoke and learn from me. That's how we do it. We've got to go back to the word, not the world. Because the world doesn't promote gentleness and humbleness. They call it a weakness. They talk about us. But I'm asking you, give them something to talk about. So when they see you still in your job in that situation, you're still standing for Jesus Christ. You won't bend. You won't bow down. Next one is patience, y'all. And here's the one, y'all. And I know it's hot. I'm hot. But stay with me real quick. The next one is patience. And, and, and this is the one, you know, how, you know how you can read scriptures and one of them just speaks to you? This is the one I struggle with, y'all. Can I be honest with you? I struggle with patience. And it's funny when you start asking God, so God, help me in patience. What does God do? Huh? He puts us in situations to test our patience. So I remember many times I would get off my knees and go back into my job because I was taste, being tested with patience on my job. And that individual who I was being tested, who was, who was trying to take my patience away from me, that person was right there. First thing in the morning, right there. And God is looking back. So now what you going to do? Are you going to believe me? Or are you going to still act and behave like you've been acting? He gives us an opportunity, y'all. Be careful what you pray for. But the word patience means this. Enduring even under affliction. Write that down. Enduring even under affliction. It's the ability to endure discomfort without fighting back. Yeah, without fighting back. When I think about, again, the cross, I look at Luke chapter 23, verses 33. It says this. You know, when Jesus was ready to be crucified, he was hanging on the cross, y'all, right? Between two thieves. He was the only innocent one between two thieves. And they were mocking him. They were spitting on him. They were doing all kinds of things to get him riled up. And you do know Jesus had the power and the authority to deal with that. But what did he say, saints? What did Jesus say? He says this. So next time when you think your patience has ran out, think about the words of Jesus. Again, because we do want to be Christ-like, right? He said, Father. He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He said, forgive them. What does our patience look like? Do we have a spirit of forgiveness in our hearts? In First, in first Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, real quick, it says this. It says, yet for this reason, this is Paul writing this, I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might be demonstrated. He might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul says, that was why Jesus Christ was patient with me. Do you understand Paul's story, right? He was not always Paul. He was Saul, and he was the persecutor of the way. And so what I'm sure when some people saw Paul coming on the scene, they said, you might be writing a lot of letters, Paul, but I know you. I've seen you. I know what you're back with. I know your reputation. But he says that because of God's patience with Paul, he should have took him out, y'all. He should have been, Paul shouldn't have even been after. He shouldn't even have the, the right to write three, 13 epistles. But see, cause this is what God does. He does it with me. Is that we grow in patience when we're faced with adversity and suffering. See, we always want to grow in Christ. But sometimes God puts us in a position while we're dependent on him totally. And that's the time that we grow. And here's the patient. It's a moment-by-moment dependency on God. And then we have to have the mindset that, God, I know that I'm tired. I know that I'm getting, my mind is starting, I'm starting to lose it. My patience is running out. But, God, I'm going to stand and believe in your promises, even when it's difficult for me to see you, Lord, because I know that you're faithful. And all I have to do is go back and look at my life. Look at my life. And God has been faithful. When we hit those mountains and we say, I don't know if I can get past this. God says, no, rewind the tape. I'm the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm still on the throne. I've never left you. 
I will never leave you or forsake you, y'all. This is the God. How is God dealing with you this morning? In your patience. In your patience. In your patience this morning. Next one is this. We'll keep moving. Completely united in our calling. Completely united in our calling. After stating the first three virtues, he talks about humility, Paul does. He talks about gentleness, and he talks about patience. Paul then states the manner in which they are to carry out one and being one by his spirit in their conduct, in their attitude. He says, now you understand these virtues and they build from one another. Now here's how you, here's how you live this thing. Here's a testimony. Here's the evidence if these things are really happening in your life. It says this. It says, showing tolerance for one another, y'all. Huh? In other words, how do we show people that we love them? How do we say that? We can say all day, I love you. Brother and sister, when we see them in church, I'm praying for you. I love you. And we might mean that, but Paul says it's more than that. It's how we're able to tolerate each other in the church when things aren't going our way. See, that's a different kind of tolerate. I can tolerate you when my own situation in my own household is taken care of. I can walk in the church with my head all high because I'm good with mine. But when I'm faced with adversity and I'm dealing with my own financial issues, my own children issues, whatever you might want to say, how can we tolerate each other in love, y'all? What does that look like? And it's not this. He didn't say when you receive love, now that you can show love, Charles. He didn't say that. He didn't say wait till you receive love from somebody. Because if that was the case, none of us would have been saved, y'all. If Jesus Christ said, I'll come down out of glory and save you once I receive your love, where would we be at right now? We would still be in verse number two, I was dead in sin and trespasses. You know what I'm saying? He didn't say, I will, you know, once you do these things. You know, and that's the thing. Think about it. We got to take this back to our own relationships. Because I'm sure, I'm not a mind reader. But I'm sure, brothers and sisters, there's some of us who've been holding on to some stuff for way too long. And the reason why we haven't let it go is because we're not feeling them, him or her, because they hurt us. And I'm not trying to belittle that. I understand that pain stings. But it says that this kind of love, this kind of tolerance right now, is not dependent on how somebody treats us. Because I'm not so focused on trying to be right or get my lick back. I want to demonstrate Christ even when somebody's not glorifying him. That's your testimony. See, it's easy when we can demonstrate him when things are going our way. But how do you know Christ is not using you to go back in that situation to testify about him? Because what happens, let's be honest, once you've been on that road long ago, I mean long, many years, and you've been praying and praying and some things, you don't get your breakthrough. See, there's a lot of churches that says all you have to do is pray and your breakthrough is coming. But I don't know. I've never read a gospel verse in the word of God that says that what it does say is that he'll be with us. And he said that our security, we'll be secure in here for all eternity. And then one day we don't have to be no more crying, no more dying one day. But he says, while you still on this side, brothers and sisters, you're going to have to go through something. You're going to have to go, hey, so in other words, we need to buckle up. We need to buckle up. So showing tolerance in love. And then it talks about this. It says that being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of peace. Being diligent. And that word diligent means to, to work hard at it. To work hard and preserve. It means to, to protect, to keep the unity of the spirit. And that word unity is this. Unity is the will of God for the church, but it must be, here it is, aggressively, continually, and individually pursued. It's not just up to the leaders. It's not just up to this side of the church right here. It's all of us that we have to eagerly pursue it. 
we got to eagerly pursue it. And he says unity, not uniformity. He says unity, not uniformity. See, unity comes from within, and it's the spirit of grace, while uniformity is the result of pressures from the outside, us without. He says that. He says that Paul doesn't tell the church to manufacture unity, but to maintain the unity already that has existed in the body. It's already there. See, see, do, do you understand before me and you again was a thought that the triune God, huh, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, he was working this thing out, and he didn't say, I'm going to work it out based on what man does. He said they were in a love. There was a love that they had for each other, a unity, and they were glorifying each other in unity. In that oneness, in that same spirit, it says before the world was even formed, it was that love affair that was going on between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the same unity that he modeled that we're supposed to have in the church. Because if we are to be in Christ, that's what he's calling us to be, y'all. It's the same unity. He's already designed. He said, you don't have to think about what unity looks like. You don't have to go and ask a bunch of people. Let me tell you, I've already designed this thing. I just want you to walk in obedience to me. Will you do that for me? It's the unity. The, joy, the God draws us together by his spirit. See, Christian unity is this. It's a, it's a common submission to God, his person, and his will. And it should result, and here it is, in a church that is united in worship, fellowship, and service. If we want to know, if we're talking about solid word again, do we have that unity that Christ is talking about in our worship, huh? in our service, in our fellowship? Are we, is solid word, too known for, and I'm just going to throw it out there, uh, are we known for our, our, our cliques, right? We got a circle of people who know each other, and they've been knowing each other for a long years. So when we got some new folk that come in the church, see, see, the, see, that should be contagious, y'all. When people walk through that door, they should be able to feel the Spirit of God in us, y'all. And they should have what we have. I can't help it. They leave this place ready and running to tell somebody. But because I know so-and-so for so long, me and him is the only ones that can go out and go to breakfast. He's the only one that I'll call when I'm going through something. Brother Pete, you put something on my heart, man. He said, Kenny, we talking about the oneness in the body. But see, I can look around and count on probably one hand somebody who's actually invited me over for dinner, to fellowship. And I've been knowing some of y'all for years. But have we got so comfortable, y'all? And we forgot that he didn't call us to be in solo in groups of three or four with our T-shirts on. But he said, I've called you to look like me. Would it bother you to one day just invite us, brother and sister, and say, will you go to lunch with me? Will you, can, can we fellas, I don't really know you, brother and sister, but I've been seeing you a while. Can we meet up? Because if we're in union with each other, I want to grow in fellowship. Can we do that? Huh? That is what God is calling us. Forget my notes. God is calling us, y'all, right now, y'all. And he started with me. He said, Kenny, your attitude has been jacked up. You've been comfortable in this thing. You're walking around here like you deserve to be saved. You've done something because you know a few Bible verses. We can come in here and play church. Sister, how you doing? I'm praying for you. And we go back and move them aside. Don't even think about them anymore. Huh? When we know people was in the hospital, do we inconvenience ourselves in our lunch break? Can we go and visit them? Can we call them and say, brother, I ain't seen you in a while. Can we do that? <sighs> my time is up. Unity in the body. That's what God put on my heart. The spirit of unity. It's the spirit of peace. And it's the peace that says this, that surpasses all understanding. See, the world doesn't understand this peace because they don't have this peace. They don't understand it. It says this. God says this. He said, in me, you may have peace. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulations. But then it says, but take courage. In other words, be of good cheer, right? 
Because guess what? He said, I already overcome the world. I've already got that thing. I've already done that thing. I've died 2,000 years ago. So you can be in me. Me. He's calling us saints to live for him. And get out of our comfort zones. It's the peace of God. For the glory of God. For the people of God. And for those one among you who don't know Jesus Christ, man, you can enjoy that same peace. I know God is patient, but God's patience does run out. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why you still have breath in your lungs, call on him. Call on Jesus so, he can, so you can have a personal relationship with him today where God has been patient with us. The church that glorifies God when it has a Christ-like attitude that is united in one with the Spirit of God, the power of God, it's this, it looks like this, when we are, as a church, committed to our calling, conduct worthy of our calling, and we are completely united as one body, serving one God by the power of God. Amen.